Shalom Chavrim. Wanted to just speak to you a moment before you watch this video here on the Sabbaths here. We have had to take and in some cases disconnect the comment uh, section on the videos. I've always liked to keep it up in order for people to be able to interact with us. We're actually moving to a, a, a format of, in some cases, no comments. In some cases, we'll have it to where we have to approve the comment. And we're not against comments that even disagree with us, so long as we do these things in an orderly fashion, in a godly way. I'm not, I'm not opposed to that at all. But what I have been seeing a lot of, not just a little bit, a lot of, are there are certain people coming in that not only are they posting in uh, disagreement, but they're also very arrogant about it. And it's even gotten completely out of hand where they're attacking people as well that do agree with what we might uh, speak about. And we do believe that we're speaking from the Word of God. Uh, the, word, the Sabbath message also has become very controversial. I had no idea that there would be this much controversy and something that God has ordained Himself, but it is. And I can understand because of some of the passages that are written, some of the things that you guys have uh, written back that have disagreed, but in a, in a godly manner. And so this video addresses those type of issues. But um, if I were to show you some of the letters that people have sent me to where people that are commenting uh, in, a, in attacking some of our viewers and then the letters that they have shown us where the people when they write them personally are just really humiliating people attacking them aggressively cursing nothing Christian whatsoever now we realize that we have touched a nerve to begin with not just because of the Sabbath we touched a nerve because we speak on the the Vatican and the evils that the Vatican is doing every day that we speak. And so therefore, the Vatican has intentionally, um, their people that support them and are trying to protect, protect this lying doctrine are sending all kinds of people. It's kind of ironic. A lot of videos are being posted on our site as well by Walid Shabbat. And I know that Walid Shabbat, he sent us a very, very ungodly uh, message one day. If I were to make that public, you'd realize there's definitely nothing Christian about it whatsoever. So again, we're going to do it to where comments have to be monitored before they're posted uh, for, this, for your safety as well as you know, for, for others as well, that we don't have things that are disrespectful. If you watch the videos and you disagree with something and you do want to make a comment to where you don't, you're not in agreement with us, but you're willing to make the comment to where it is in a Christian manner, you know, to where it's done respectfully the way we should do. If we disagree with one another, we should be heard in that disagreement. But if it's going to be just to badger or to do something that is evil, we will have to block those type comments. I'm sorry that we had to come to this particular point in the ministry, but I guess as you, as you grow and you reach uh, people and you're trying to bring out truth, it was just like we see in the Bible where Satan was wroth with the woman in Revelation. He went after her, the woman with the man-child. Well, when he couldn't get her and he couldn't get the man-child, then the Bible said that Satan went after the remnant of the woman's seed. Now, that's the Jewish people, which I happen to be of one of those type people, my wife as well as Jewish. So Satan is on his attack trying to shut us up because Satan doesn't want the Jewish people to believe either. And so Anyway, I, I trust and hope that this video will be a blessing to you. I've gone much deeper into the Sabbath, uh, answering, I believe, a lot of the, the, um, the arguments against what we said earlier. Uh, and I trust it's a blessing for you. God bless you. Baruch Hashem. Uh, let me just say this, though, before we get started. If you serve the Lord on Sunday and that's something that you do, that's, that's your prerogative. Uh, we're not here to try to change people. And in fact, I've gotten emails before, you know, Brother Steve, I go to church on Sunday, but I've been wanting to, to keep the Sabbath. How do I keep the Sabbath? Well, you can still keep the Sabbath and go to church on Sunday too. It's not going to hurt anything. Uh, keeping the Sabbath is the, the, the one day of the week that we set aside for the Lord, which is the seventh, uh, excuse me, the, the, yeah, the seventh day of the week. Uh, in Hebrew, our days are numbered, first day, second day, third day, etc., like I told you before. 
And the seventh day is a day that God rested. It was something he commemorated. It's actually uh, the commandment that was given was done long before Moses' Ten Commandments. So this is an ordinance that God set into motion. Uh, and so, uh, so therefore, when he set it into motion through the Ten Commandments, it's something that God put there as an ordinance for us as well to keep this holy. And so I want to share with you some, some very deep scriptures. I may get a little excited about this because I am passionate about it. And I think that it, it, the Sabbath is a very important issue. Paul um, kept the Sabbath, as the Bible says, was his custom. Uh, so I don't think Paul would speak against it if he kept it. Uh, Yeshua as well, he kept the Sabbath. Uh, and so I don't think that he would speak against it if he kept it. Kept it. Uh, so the apostles kept it. All the historical documentations we have, uh, the apostles were Sabbath keepers. In fact, the Sabbath was never done any different amongst any of the Christian groups until Constantine uh, did the change. I think it was in 321 uh, CE in the Common Era. Common Era. Uh, it is a Common Era too, by the way. So nice and to talk. All right, let me take you right through here. Now, keep in mind though now, uh, Gentiles are the, uh, the Christian believers that are non-Jews. You guys are grafted into the very tree of the Jewish branch. The branch being Yeshua. He's Christ. He's the, he is that branch. And you guys are grafted in with us. So see, you become partakers of the same word of God that we have. And so let's take a serious look at the word here. All right. Now, let's start off right here by Matthew chapter 5 is where we're, gonna, is where we're going to begin this. Um, and a uh, familiar scripture with many of you guys, verse 17, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. Now this is Yeshua himself speaking, Jesus, okay? I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Okay, now actually the word fulfilled in the Greek there, that is to be manifested within us. It's not just, in other words, comes to an end, it's living in us. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now wait a minute, now Yeshua is tell, talking about the commandments and he's teaching us right here that if we teach these commandments, then we're called great, but if we teach man to break them, we're called least. So if you don't honor, or if you don't believe that uh, Saturday is the Sabbath day, and you teach men that it's not the Sabbath, it's not something that you lose your soul over, because clearly there's those that make it to heaven that taught that it wasn't, you know? And it's just that they're at least in the kingdom of heaven because they did not honor the commandments that God laid out. Now, we're going to find out how we know it is these commandments because he begins to speak about those. Now, let's look at this. Verse 20 here. All right, for I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it is said of by them of old time, thou shalt not kill. Now that's one of the commandments, clearly. Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment, and whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council, but whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Now, Yeshua is magnifying or making greater the law in this case here. And he goes even outside of the actual Torah commandment. All right, now verse 21, you have heard that it is said of them of old time, thou shalt not, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, we just did this. <laughs> um, uh, verse uh, 23, I'm sorry, we're actually, let's skip down. Um, we'll go to verse 27. He goes into some of that other things here. You have heard that it is said of them of old time, thou shalt not, you know, I, I'll tell you what, no, I, I, I really, you guys need to know a little bit more of this. Let me, let me take you here to Matthew uh, 23. I, I wanted to cut some of this out just for the sake of time, but you know, there is a point that needs to be made in, in this. So let me just turn to it. With. All right, so yeah, let's go to verse 27. You have heard that it is said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. 
Okay, another one of the Ten Commandments. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Now what does he do? He's magnifying, he's exalting the very law that God gave. Makes it greater. Verse 31, it hath been said, whosoever shall put away his wife, let, let him give her a writing of divorcement. Now this is not in the Ten Commandments. Now you're getting into the laws of Moses, the very laws that are handwritten down that God gave Moses. But he says, But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving of the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. Because if you go to Isaiah 42, verse 21, it says here, the Lord, and that is Hashem himself, is well pleased for his righteousness sake. He will magnify the law and make it honorable. Who's the one that magnifies it and makes it honorable? It's Yeshua himself. So inside the man Yeshua is Hashem himself, the Lord. That's, it was actually Isaiah 42 is a prophecy that when you would see Hashem himself magnifying the law, or the Torah in this case, that it would be magnified and make it honorable, then you know that's God in that man. Well, that's exactly what Yeshua was doing in Matthew chapter 5 here. All right, so anyway, um, let's, let's move on. I want to take you uh, to a lot of other places. One of the, one of the debates that really came in uh, is the one from Colossians chapter 2, verses 12 to 15. And so let me just read this to you. And it, and it does sound very uh, convincing, but we have to look to see what it is that is being uh, nailed to the cross. This is where it says nailing to the cross. All right. Colossians chapter 2, verse 12, buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and in uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him having forgiveness you excuse me, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Now did you notice what Paul wrote here? handwriting of or the handwriting of ordinances nothing about the 10 commandments nothing about the laws of god that he wrote with his finger but handwritten ordinances or handwriting of ordinances okay and having spoiled principalities and powers he made and show of them openly triumphing over them in it see let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day, or of new moon, or of the Sabbath days. Now see, one thing that a lot of people don't understand is that the Sabbath days are actually certain feast days. And th that is true, because see, you have to understand, the Christian is not bound by a lot of things that the Jewish people are, are actually kept, are bound by. So, but what is Paul actually speaking about? Well, if we go to, to Ezekiel 45, we can find out exactly what he's talking about. It says in Ezekiel 45, And it shall be the prince's part to give burnt offerings and meat offerings and drink offerings in the feast and in the new moons and in the Sabbaths. Plural. Because see, God calls it Sabbaths because why? Like, for example, if you take the Passover... The Passover, when we do Passover, we have an X, X number of days that are involved in Passover. That's considered Sabbath to us as Jews because we are not to work. We're on certain different high holidays, we're commanded not to work during those times. But in this particular part, in Ezekiel's prophecy here, he specifically mentions the drink offerings and the burnt offerings, uh, which is something that's kind of unusual, but that's exactly what Paul speaks about in Colossians 2.16. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of a new moon or of the Sabbath days. No mention of the Sabbath itself, but the Sabbath days. 
Okay, so in all, in, going back to Ezekiel, in Solomon, of the house of Israel, he shall prepare the sin offering and the meat offering and the burnt offering and the peace offerings to make reconciliation for the house of Israel. Exactly. You see, what got nailed to the cross? The sacrificial order got nailed to the cross. This is what Paul is writing about. Once you have received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and as a believer in Yeshua, you have no more need of this particular ordinances here that was going on. Well, why does it say Sabbath days? Because this was the time that in Israel that we took and we were preparing for the sacrifice to be offered up to Israel once per year. And it was called a Sabbath days because we were to not work during the time of this particular Passover event. And the king had to come out and offer the meat and the drink offerings. You see, it was nailed to the cross. What is Paul showing you here? He is showing you that Yeshua fulfilled this particular passage. And that's why you don't have to be judged by any man in meat offerings and drink offerings. No, you don't have to go and participate in Israel in a sacrificial ceremony. You don't have to do the meat offerings, the drink offerings, and you certainly don't have to offer up a lamb and cut its throat before God because it's already been done. That's what he's talking about being nailed to the cross. It was the fulfillment of Passover. Oh my gosh, brother, sister, not the Ten Commandments, it's fulfillment of Passover. Okay, now, before, before we move on to the next section here, I, something, I, one thing I don't want you to get confused with when I say the sacrifice offered once a year, as far as in the Passover sacrifice, uh, is for, uh, with the... Um, the um, Feast of Atonement in the seventh month of the year in, Le in the Levitical law. Under the Levitical law, the, the, the scapegoat and the sacrificial goat that was to be done by Aaron and the priest, where Aaron would enter into the Holy of Holies, or the high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies. It is a different, um, a different feast altogether, but a good point, and let me just read this with you, because that is under Levitical law um, as well, but a reason it's a good point to bring this up it's because in Leviticus 16, it says, And this shall be a statute forever unto you, that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict your souls and do no work at all, whether it be one of your own country or a stranger that sojourneth among you. For on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you, that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. It shall be a Sabbath of rest unto you. See, again, there is the Sabbath days. But this particular ordinance is not nailed to the cross, but it is not required of the Gentiles because the thing is, as Gentiles, you are recognizing that Yeshua is indeed the sacrificial lamb. And so therefore, you have nothing to atone for as far as your sins. You have recognized them if you've believed it. But the thing is, this also, the way you know you have recognized him is by receiving of the Holy Ghost. Uh, now, I say this, let me, let me, I know that this is going to be a question. Because, you know, one of the points that I point out, and, and I've seen this in some of the comments uh, on, on the videos already, uh, they say, Brother Steve says that if you don't keep the Sabbath, uh, you'll be put to death. You know, it's amazing how people will misconstrue what you say to try to prove their little point. Uh, and it's really sad that you were to say something like that, uh, those of you that are making those comments. Another thing that kind of blows me away, too, when people really hate you that bad, why do they hang around? Why do they listen? Uh, you know, you may not realize this, but the Catholic Church knows we've struck a nerve with them. So they send their little uh, people in there to really try to cause havoc. And, uh, and they post Wallet Shabbat videos everywhere to try to get you to listen to Wallet Shabbat, hoping that you'll believe the nonsense that is there. So, uh, but anyhow, uh, the thing is, is God said that if you didn't keep his Sabbath, you would surely die. And yes, you will. Now, I'm not talking about the literal day. See, because the literal day that God set aside the Sabbath, he said, if you did not keep it, you would die. The reason why he even put the law there to start with was to foreshadow the receiving of the Holy Ghost. If you do not enter into his rest and receive the Holy Spirit as written in the book of Hebrews here, then guess what? You will surely die. 
because without his life in you, you will die. Just like he told Adam and Eve, that day you eat thereof, that day you will die. So, you know, come on, guys, you have to realize that this is much deeper than what than what it appears just at, at uh, what we might say face value. All right. So let's real quick look real quick here in the book of Hebrews. And by the way, this is not written by Paul either. Some people think it's Paul. If you ever look deeply, you realize it's nothing to do with the style that Paul writes. And this is actually written um, by a woman. And uh, it is uh, some believe to be that it is actually uh, um, Priscilla and Aquila, it was, it, was, uh, it was his wife there that actually wrote this. And, and I can certainly believe that. Uh, anyway, let's go here, chapter 4, verse 4. For he, for he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. You see, so this was an ordinance that God set up at the beginning when he was creating man. And, I mean, actually, he creates everything on the earth, and then we know that God takes and he rests on the seventh day. Uh, so after the creation is finished, God rests. But the ordinance is all the way back then. And it kind of makes you wonder what goes on in heaven as well, even before the creation. Because even when God talks to Moses, he was fashioning everything after what he saw in heaven. So could it be that the Sabbath was even at that time? Uh, that's up for debate. I have no idea. I can't prove it by Scripture other than to say that Moses was fas fastening, uh, fashioning everything after what God had shown him in heaven. Okay, verse 5, In all the places again, if they shall enter into my rest, uh, and uh, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter in therein, they to whom it was first preached unto not uh, preached, entered not in because of unbelief. Again, he limited a certain day, saying to David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Yeshua had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Okay, now, so the Sabbath, the, the actual Sabbath day, is not works to begin with. If we see that God nails to the cross the works... Dead works are nailed to the cross. Sabbath is a day of rest. And if we see clearly in Revelation 14 that God says that uh, those that keep the commandments of the Lord and the testimony of Jesus. Oh my gosh. All right, let, me, let me ask you this here. When we look at when God takes and, and we realize that there's no more works, then we have to ask this question here. The Ten Commandments clearly, and as you'll see as we continue to go through this message here, you're going to see the Ten Commandments have nothing to do with works. Works are the things that God gave us in the Levitical Law where Moses says, okay, you've done this, you must offer this. You must bring this bullock, you must bring this lamb, you must bring this turtle dove. Uh, you, you, you know, there, there was always some kind of works that we had to do in order to serve God. We were work, 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 work. But the Ten Commandments have nothing to do with works. Think about it. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Do you have to work to do that? No. Second commandment. Thou shalt not have, make unto uh, thee any graven images. Well, the only guy that's going to do any work is like the Vatican. They have a ton of graven images, so they're working pretty doggone hard. Uh, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. No works in that either. We just don't, don't try it. Don't try to say his name. You don't know it? Leave it alone. See? Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Well, on the Sabbath day, we're supposed to rest. There again, we're doing no works. Honor thy father and thy mother. It's not a work law at all. Okay? Thou shalt not kill. Again, if you're going to kill somebody, it's going to take a little bit of work, a little effort to be put forth to do it. But if you do what God says, thou shalt not kill then there's no works at all. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Well, the guy that's going to commit adultery has got a lot of work on his hands as well because he's got a whole lot to do in order to commit the adultery. But if you do what God says, then you're not working in the first place. You're resting. 
There's no labor in not committing adultery. Hmm, thou shalt not steal. Again, if you're going to steal, you got to plan. you got to figure out how you're going to do it. You're going to have to carry the money, whatever you're planning on stealing. If you're going to steal a tractor or whatever that the case might be, you got some works to do. But if you don't steal, there's no works, is there? Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Again, don't speak evil of anyone. There's no works involved in that. Thou shalt not covet. Do you see anything where in the Ten Commandments that it requires work? See, the Ten Commandments have nothing to do with works. It is not bringing sacrifices for this or that, or washing yourself, or, or, or preparing for this, or, or making ready for that. All the commandments that God gave, all the ordinances that He gave through Moses for us, that required us to do certain things, those are works. But when we receive the Holy Ghost, we've entered into His rest. Now, as we'll also notice... It's written on the tables of our heart. And if God has written the laws on the tables of our heart, the laws are written on the table of our heart. Hello? Then if they're written there, they're no longer written in stone. God, you know what I'm talking about. Mm. Ah. All right. So now so let's, let's go into this deeper now. All right. Wow. This gets beautiful, though. You'll understand now, you know, I am not trying to tell you you have to do Sabbath. Because clearly, the Bible says if you teach men not to do these commandments, you still make it into heaven. You just, you're least in the kingdom. I'd rather be there than not get there at all. See, you have to understand, God knows many Christians have no idea about the Sabbath. There are, are millions of Christians in churches today that, have, that really know nothing about the Sabbath. They've been taught wrong all their life by their church leaders, etc. And maybe a lot of the church leaders don't know any better themselves either. Maybe they've gotten mixed up in, 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 in theology. But the thing is, is as we learn and we know to do right, can we not try to do right? I mean, I know what the problem is because in, in, in modern times, especially Friday night and Saturday night and all day Saturday, I mean, Friday night's the party night, Saturday night's the party night, and all day Saturday is football and, 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 and all kinds of activities and everything. And, and man, we're off, man. We got to go have us some fun. And, and, and we'll, we'll make sure we get to church on Sunday just before we have to go back to work on Monday. But that's not what God asked. God specifically asked for a time to be set aside. And he first set it aside before man was ever created. Okay, so let's take a look a little bit more at this. All right. In Mark chapter 7, starting with verse 6, Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. All right, I, I, I want to back up with you here just a little bit and reread Mark um, 7, verse 7. How be it in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men? For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the traditions of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such things like this you do. Verse 9 and he said unto them, this is Yeshua speaking here now, full well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your own tradition. You know, the churches have, are just guilty. I mean, everybody wants to blame the Jews about how they missed Yeshua coming. Uh, but you have to understand, we missed him because of all these traditions and stuff that we had in the way. You know, we're trying to follow an oral law. Well, you know, the thing is, is the churches are doing the exact same thing that Israel did 2,000 years ago, trying to follow oral traditions. And you call it the Word of God when it's not. Now, I'll give you a good example of that, okay? Um, uh, let's see here. You know, the Catholic Church has, has already admitted that there is no biblical basis for a, uh, uh, the Saturday, uh, or excuse me, excuse me, no biblical basis for changing Saturday, the, the, the Sabbath day, the seventh day, uh, to Sunday as the Lord's day. They, they, they know that. Um, and, and of course, we know that Jesus says he is the master. You know, he said, I am the Lord or the master of the Sabbath, which is the seventh day, not Sunday, but the Sabbath day, the seventh day. And by the way, you have to remember, the, the, the laws of God, 
the commandments of God. The Ten Commandments are moral laws. These are not laws that require work. We just discussed that a little bit earlier in the video, but I just want to kind of bring that back to your mind there. They're oral laws. Excuse me, moral, not oral, moral laws. Uh, the omission is, uh, is, is in many Catholic articles. For example, from one of these is the Catholic Virginium on, on October 1st, 1947. The article reads like this here, and I quote, For example, nowhere in the Bible do we find that Christ or the apostles order that the Sabbath be changed from Saturday to Sunday. We have the commandment of God given to Moses to keep, the, keep holy the Sabbath day, that is the seventh day of the week, Saturday. Today, most Christians keep Sunday because it has been revealed to us by the Roman Catholic Church outside of the Bible. Did you notice that? It was revealed to you by the Roman Catholic Church, which is outside of the Bible. End of quote, by the way. Another good one for you. This is, uh, is a Catholic article. It's by David B. Ray. Uh, it's called The Popal uh, Controversy States. And this is what he states in his article. And I quote, From this same Catholic Church, you have accepted your Sunday, and that Sunday as the Lord's Day. She has handed down as a tradition and the entire Protestant world has accepted it as tradition. For you have not the iota of Scripture to establish it. And this is the Vatican. This is the Catholic Church writing this for you by David B. Ray. Okay? You don't have an iota of Scripture to establish it for a Sunday law. Therefore, that which you... Protestants have accepted as your rule of faith, inadequate as it of course is, as well as your Sunday, you have accepted on the authority of the Roman Catholic Church, close quote, excuse me, close quote, <laughs> give my tongue to us here, close quote. Okay, now, in light of that, and this is just, I mean, it goes perfectly along your, the traditions of man. But the problem is everybody's following Rome. You know, now you have to understand, I believe it's the Seventh-day Adventists that believe that the Sunday law is, uh, is actually going to be the mark of the beast. I can't necessarily go along with that, you know, but I can see why they would think that. I mean, especially in light of the fact right now, the Vatican is pushing to make it mandatory that all businesses are closed on Sunday. They're doing that in Israel, believe it or not. They're doing it in the United States, and they're, and they're pushing it for, uh, in fact, I think the European Union is already accepting it. I don't know when they're going to put it into law. But, you know, I still, though, I can't say that's the mark of the beast. I, I, I really can't go in that direction. But I will say this regarding what they do. Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall swear, uh, excuse me, shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. The commandment of God and the fourth commandment is keep the Sabbath day holy. Honor, keep it holy. He changed that for you. And they shall uh, be given into his hand until a time and times and a dividing of time. In other words, he's going to, not, he's going to make it law and you're going to have to obey it, what, for three and a half years. Think about that for a while. Let's continue back on this. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other like things you do. Now, he's really, he's talking about the Jewish people and the different customs that the rabbis have from the oral law. And nowadays we have the Mishnah, the Midrash, all these different books, the Talmud, etc. They bring in what we consider to be the oral law of Moses that really is a bunch of nonsense because if it was the oral law of Moses, why is it so messed up the way it is? So we know these books are nonsense to begin with. Uh, so, you know, Yeshua is dealing with this with the Jewish people. And he says, you teach, uh, you know, the doctrines of men as, as, as if it were the commandments of God. 
Uh, then he goes on to say uh, unto them, Full well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your own tradition. Now that's the important part we need to know as uh, Christian believers or believers in Yeshua. I, I don't like to be called a Christian myself. I prefer to be called uh, a believer in Yeshua. And nothing against the Christian people, but unfortunately, they tack on... Uh, I say that because in Judaism, you know, most Jews that are rabbis and stuff, they believe that the Catholic Church is Christians. And, you know, we know good and well that that system is demonic, so how could it be Christians? They consider the Presbyterians who are just bashing Israel to no end right now, they call that Christianity. That's not Christianity. I mean, come on, let's, let's get real. So anyway... So you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your own tradition. For Moses said, Honor thy father and mother, and whosoever curseth father or mother, let him die the death. Now he's quoting one of the Ten Commandments. But you say, If a man shall say to his father or mother, It is for Corban, that is to say, A gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. And you suffer him no more to do aught for his father or mother. Now see, that's exactly what people are doing with the Sabbath day. Oh, we don't have to do the Sabbath because all the commandments were done away with. You know, we, don't forget now, at the very beginning here, Jesus, we read right here, Think not I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I have come to I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Hmm. You're fixing to find out what he meant by fulfill. That's going to be very interesting. I think you'll like it too. Even those that are not for the, uh, the Sabbath idea, I think you guys will like it too. Once you see what fulfill really is. Okay, so, but you say, okay, we already know about that. Uh, verse 13, chapter 7 in the book of Mark. Make the word of God of non-effect through your tradition, which you have delivered, and many such like things you do. Now, you've got to remember, the church today is only walking in the footsteps of what Israel did. You know, it's funny because a lot of times, especially replacement the uh, theologists, they say that we are now Israel. Well, in one regard, I have to agree with you. You are now Israel because the same mistakes my forefathers made in rejecting Christ and, and crucifying Him that many of the church, such as the Vatican and other denominational systems, are doing the exact same thing. You are crucifying Yeshua before the people openly and publicly by crucifying His Word. You disbelieve it. You claim to be religious, but you totally crucify the Word of God. Um, all right, let's see. So verse 14, and he had called all the people unto him and said to them, hearken unto me, every one of you, and understand, there is nothing from without a man that entereth into him that can defile him. But the things which come out of him, those are that defile the man. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was entered into the house from the people, his disciples asked him concerning the parable, and he said, Are you so without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatsoever thing from without entereth into the man, it cannot defile him, because it entereth in not in his heart, but in the belly? Keep that in mind. It doesn't enter into his heart. It goes into the belly. All right? Now, so, he says, uh, it cannot defy him, because it entereth in, uh, not into his heart, but into the belly, and goeth out in the drought, purging all meats. And he said, that which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceitfulness, lasciviousness, evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within, and defile the man. It's important to keep that in mind. I, I, I said it's a little bit prematurely, but I want you to remember that. Now, let's take a look in the book of Exodus, chapter 20, because now we're going to look at some of the, the Sabbath uh, ordinances that God laid out. In Exodus, chapter 20, verse 8, God says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. All right? Remember, you're grafted into the tree. So, it's... For you as well it is for us. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but there, the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. What do you know? That includes the Gentile believers that come in. Why? You come into the same fold. For in six days the Lord had made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and all that is therein, and rested in the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. 
All right, now the Sabbath was before man was ever created. So this ordinance is, God is showing us here, he set this as an ordinance to us. It's a perpetual ordinance to all generations. And even the stranger that comes into your gates. Did not Yeshua say, I have other sheep that are not of this fold? Oh, wow. That's the Gentiles. And did he not say, I am the door to the sheepfold or the gate in Hebrew is what it would be called, the Yeshua, the gate? Oh, that's interesting. So, therefore, uh, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. So see, as a Gentile, you're also, you have come in through Christ as part through the blood atonement that he's gave. So the part that's nailed to the cross is you don't have to worry about sacrifices anymore. Neither do we as Jews is that we believe that Yeshua is Messiah. We don't have to worry about sacrifices either, nor, nor drink, nor meats. None of the offerings do we have to deal with. None of the Passover sacrificial ceremonies do we have to be a part of. But he didn't nail the Ten Commandments to the cross. Okay. So let's look at this a little bit further. Let's, let's take a look at Revelation 14 in light of this. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. You got to be kidding me. Revelation chapter 14, verse 12, written by John, 90 years after Yeshua was on earth. And he says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of who? God. And do what? And the faith of Yeshua, Jesus. That's interesting. All right, Leviticus 19, verse 30. You shall keep my Sabbaths and re reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. Now, for Israel, that's not just Sabbath days. That's also, the, as we said, the one that got nailed to the cross, the Passover in particular. Now, that actually, because he rep, rep, referenced that in Ezekiel there, that actually has nothing to do with another set of ordinances that he didn't reference. And that was what? The Feast of Trumpets. Those are Sabbaths as well. But those are not nailed to the cross. Why? Yeshua has not fulfilled those yet. So see, we have to make sure we rightly divide the word. There's some things that are fulfilled, some things that are not fulfilled. So there are some Sabbaths that have never been fulfilled. So when Paul actually gives you that commandment, he only gives you the commandment for the sacrificial ordinances. And he's clearly, he identifies what the ordinances are. Which ones were nailed to the cross? So you shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. So when it comes to Yom Kippur and things like that, we are supposed to honor that right along with the Jewish people. Do you know that the, the, the uh, Yom Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, God will make it kept in the millennium as well? You don't think you won't keep a Sabbath? That'll be the Sabbaths, plural, where you do not work during the time of Yom Sukkot. And that is a commandment of God in the millennium. So you don't think you won't be keeping Sabbaths? In fact, God says that that nation that does not keep that Sabbath, that nation will be cut off. They'll have no rain or anything. God won't be playing around in the millennium. You'll be thinking differently then. Now, I know we have people that say, well, we don't even know really what day is Saturday. But you know what? The thing is, is we already have a calendar right now. We know it's not accurate. But even the Jewish people, we realize it's not accurate either. But we can't say for sure with certainty what that day is. So we at least honor it to where God will honor what we're trying to do. Okay, let's take it. Let's go. Like I said, Leviticus uh, 19.30, we read that. Jeremiah shows a future that is fulfilled regarding the temple. So what about his Sabbaths? Um, that's something I wanted. I really wanted to talk to you about as well. Leviticus 19.30, You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. Notice he included not only the Sabbaths, but he included reverence my sanctuary, the temple. Now, that's interesting because, you know, we did in a message I did with you recently, I talked about 
In Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 28, it says, The voice of them that flee and escape out of the land of Babylon to declare in Zion the vengeance of the Lord our God for the vengeance of his temple. What did God say in Leviticus 19.30? You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord, Hashem. You reverence his sanctuary. Well, God speaks about here in Jeremiah. He's coming for vengeance because of why? The Romans did not reverence his sanctuary. They did not have respect for the temple of God that was built in Jerusalem. And I know that people say, well, we are the temple of God. That's true. But God is so angry over this, he's coming to take and destroy Rome. Of course, the vengeance of his temple, we, have, we realize it is a compound fulfillment as well. Not only is God angry with Rome for destroying the temple in 70 AD, but Yeshua himself, as he even pointed out, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. So he himself, his own body, is also the temple of God, wherein what the Holy Ghost was dwelling inside of him, the Sabbath was in him. No one writes that he's the master of the Sabbath because he was the Sabbath. He carried the Sabbath within, within his own bosom. You know, so when he died, and of course the Romans themselves were the ones that actually did the dirty work, now, we as Jews, we had to do as Moses clearly showed in the law that we would judge him. The elders of Israel would judge him in smiting the rock. Uh, he took the elder, elder, elders of Israel out. This was like two weeks into the journey on the Exodus story there. They go out, they smite the rock to bring forth this water to be able to, to, for the thirsty people to be able to drink that were dying. And as a people, we were dying, including the Christians of today. Without the Holy Ghost, you're dying. You see? And so therefore, the vengeance of the Lord is twofold, is to deal with the fact that Yeshua, that the Romans nailed him to that cross and then pierced his side. See? His side was thrust through with the spear. But it's also because in 70 AD, they destroyed the temple as well. So God has a twofold purpose in fulfilling that particular passage. Let's move on. And we find that we find it in two places in the Bible, also in Jeremiah 51, 11, where he, again he says, because it is the vengeance of the Lord, the vengeance of his temple, that he destroys Babylon. All right, now, let's go to um, Corinthians chapter 3. Do we begin again to commend ourselves, or need we, as some other epistles of commendation to you, or letters or commendations from you? You are epistles written in our hearts, known and read of all men. Now that's us, that's our lives, uh, before God and before the people. The people will not read the Bible, they're going to read your life, all right? Now this one's very important here in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and I really want you to really pay attention to this one here, because again, a lot of people think that the commandment of God is done away with, but we're going to find out it's not the commandment. Let's see what he says here. For as much, verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 3, 2 Corinthians, For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. In other words, the Holy Ghost is in you, and you're not, your life does not have to write words. What you live is what people are going to read. Okay, keep that in mind. Not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. Ooh, I love that one right there. You see, God takes and he puts his word in your heart. The Ten Commandments come from the table of stone and go from the table of stone and God writes them on your heart. With what? With the Holy Ghost. And if you don't have the Holy Ghost, those laws are not written in your heart as of yet. All right? Now, verse 4, As such trust have we through Christ to Godward. Verse 5, Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. What does he mean by the letter killeth? The letter is the law, and the law says, if you do this, you shall die. If you break the Sabbath, you are to be killed for breaking the Sabbath. 
The letter killeth. Now if you break it, as we see clearly in the word of God here, he that teaches against these commandments shall be the least in the kingdom of God. But he that teaches you to do these commandments, the Ten Commandments that is, he shall be called great in the kingdom of God. So when he says the letter killeth, in the times before the Holy Ghost was poured out, if you broke that commandment, you died. Without mercy, you were killed and stoned without mercy. But the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, comes down and pardons you. And therefore, if you make that mistake, see, God knew that the Vatican through Constantine was going to come in and teach the people a bunch of lies, that there is no such thing as a Sabbath, that the commandments of God are done away with, and he knew many of his children that would believe him, that would love him, that would try to serve him, would end up not knowing that the Sabbath is a holy day to God because they'd be confused with the different teachings. So therefore, the letter that killeth, it doesn't kill you now. If you make that mistake, he will pardon you. That was in verse, verse 6. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. But the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which the glory was to be done away with. What glory? The glory of the countenance that was upon Moses. God had no desire that his glory just be upon you on the outside. God wanted his glory to be inside of you. That's what he's talking about. God doesn't want the glory of God just to, you know, come upon you and everybody see the glory on the outside of you. God wants it to be on the inside of you. So as what Jesus said, that which defiles the man is not that, 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 that takes and comes in, but it's what comes out. So you got to get the Holy Ghost in you so that what comes out of you is righteousness and holiness. That's why Jesus says that which goes into the man does not, it doesn't hurt him. It doesn't defile him because it just, it's something comes in your mouth and it just goes out to the draught. But that which is within the heart is what defileth the man because of the evilness and, and everything else. Why? Because Jesus knew they were living under the law and the law was the letter and the letter killeth. What he knew is that you had need of was the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost. And the only way he'd get the Holy Ghost into you was for him to die on the cross. That's why Paul said he nailed those ordinances to the cross See, not the Ten Commandments, but the ordinance of what? Passover. Where you, that's, where the, that's where the prince come out and he did the drink offering and the meat offering. And that's where the sacrifice was offered for the sins of Israel once a year. You don't have to be judged anymore like that. And that was a Sabbath. That was those days. The reason it's plural is because those were the rest days of Passover. Oh my gosh. But if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of the countenance, which glory was done away, only the glory that was of his countenance, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? See, that's how you know what he's talking about. It's the Spirit that's glorious. And on Moses, it was just the outer part. He ain't talking about the law. He's not talking about the stones that were written on. For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of the righteousness succeed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by the reason of the glory that excelleth. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. See? It's that's the, the Holy Spirit, because why? The Holy Spirit was going to remain. He said, I won't leave you comfortless, but I'll send the Holy Ghost and he will abide with you. And, you know, not, not he, I'm sorry, Jesus didn't say that. He says, I will abide with you, even in you to the consummation. Oh, praise be to God. All right, let's go to John chapter 14. Yet a little while, and this is Yeshua speaking, Jesus a little while and the world seeth me no more, but you see me because I live, you shall live also. And at that day you shall know that I am in the Father and, the fa and, 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 and my Father and, and ye in me and I in you. That's what he's talking about. This is the fulfillment of what's written in 2 Corinthians, okay? He 
that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he is, it, it is, that loveth me. See? And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. See? Not just, not just, just he, he that hath my commandments. Oh, my goodness. What did he say in his commandments in the very beginning? Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. <sighs> Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, the Lord, how is it thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said to him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. But pray you that your flight not be, uh, not be in winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Oh, you're kidding me. Again, Yeshua puts the Sabbath day in the future. For then shall be great tribulation, such as not since the beginning of the world, nor to this time, nor ever shall be. Well, I thought the Sabbaths were over. And now Yeshua is speaking about the Sabbaths when a great tribulation will come upon the Jews. Well, if he had taught that there were no more Sabbaths, why would he mention the Sabbaths again? Interesting, isn't it? Let's go to Mark chapter 10, verse 18. And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one that is God. Thou knowest the commandments, because the man asks him, he says, you know, Lord, what must I do to receive eternal life? Now, that's interesting. The question to Yeshua was, what must I do to receive eternal life? All right, and so Jesus is going to answer him. Thou knowest the commandments. That's part of receiving eternal life. Well, according to Jesus, it is. And according to what he just said back here, if you keep my commandments... You remember when I did the message the other day and I said, why did Yeshua write in the sand with his finger? He was showing that he was the very God that wrote the Ten Commandments. That's why he wrote in the sand with his finger. Because God wrote the Ten Commandments with his finger. Yeshua's writing in the sand one of the commandments with his finger that causes these men to feel guilty and every one of them to walk away and leave. He is God manifested in a human being called the Son of God. All right, so, so it says, Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. Now, he doesn't quote all ten of them. He actually quotes the seventh commandment, the sixth commandment, the eighth commandment, the ninth commandment, and the fifth commandment, but he does not quote them in order. That's what I meant to say. My apology. Let me go on and read what he says. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth, then Jesus, beholding him, loved him, and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasures in heaven, and come take up the cross, and follow me. Now what's interesting is this rich young ruler, he has kept the commandments. Now, Yeshua doesn't quote all the commandments. In fact, the, the mere fact he doesn't quote them in order it really clearly shows that he implies the Ten Commandments. So he's just giving a general observation. These are the, you know, that you know the commandments. So he doesn't have to quote them all to him. And we know that this is uh, something that is not that Yeshua leaves out the rest of them. He doesn't leave out the first, second, third, or the fourth commandment in real life, which the fourth commandment being the Sabbath day. And we know that clearly because there's other places that he does quote some of these other commandments as well. So, what, does it, what is the uh, first commandment? Thou shalt not have other, no other gods before me. Okay, the second commandment. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. The third, thou shalt not take the Lord thy God's name in vain. The fourth, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And the tenth commandment, he also did not quote to him. Thou shalt not covet because none of these, see, of course, thou shalt not covet. Uh, as we know, none of these applied, you know, none of these were, 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 were done right there. So it doesn't, it doesn't mean that, that he did not apply them. Um, and it'd be foolish to even, to, to even think that. Um, see, another, another place, Jesus says here, the first of all commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord 
our God is one Lord. All right. Now that's interesting because that's not one of the Ten Commandments. But yet Yeshua calls it a commandment, and it is one of the. He said it's the. It's, uh, it is the first commandments. Uh, another one he says, the first of all commandments. Oh, that is. I'm sorry. That is, that is the first of all commandments. Okay. Now we're getting getting close to closing here. Um, you know. Now, let me just share this with you. We really cannot see any place in Scripture where Yeshua has ever taken out the Sabbath. Like I said to you, the Sabbath day, it's a covenant. You know, it's a covenant between God's people and Him, the Sabbath day. That's what, that's what sets you apart. That's what sets you different from everyone else. So in light of the things that we've shared here, you know, and I mean, we could go on and on and on and on and on. I mean, Scripture after Scripture after Scripture that proves the Sabbath. But I've taken some of the different arguments that, that have been presented and helped you to see it in the correct light. Because I'm sitting here watching, as well as my wife, as she goes through a lot of the comments that are made, and we see people trying to put these arguments out here that seem to be very persuasive. And then it causes people to stumble. They think, oh gosh, you're right. Maybe uh, we don't have to keep that because you're right. It was all nailed to the cross. Ten Commandments were never nailed to the cross. There's not a single scripture that you can put on that. So, and, and if, if it, let's say if, if, if you take it and you really think that it's literally that it's nailed to the cross, and if you can, then in that case, if we don't keep the Sabbath, if the Ten Commandments are nailed to the cross, where, as I've already showed you, it's, it's mixed up in the way people have presented it, then what about you can have another God besides God? Well, in fact, because people are breaking the Sabbath, that's exactly what they do. They put other things in their life before God, and they don't honor the Sabbath. That's one thing for sure. So you do have other gods besides God, because he's, you're definitely, people definitely, many people do not honor the Sabbath. Now, I will say this, though. Many people just don't know any better. And that's how wonderful God is in His mercy. And when you receive the Holy Ghost, he actually, by receiving the Holy Ghost, this was to be that God wrote the, the, the Ten Commandments on your heart. So that you don't even have to have the stone, you just know to do it. Do you know before even Moses wrote the Ten Commandments that many of the people lived by them? Remember how Yeshua magnified the law? And he talked about, you know, that a man's uh, wife must be dead. You remember Abraham, the story of Abraham when Amalek took his wife and the Lord comes to him in a dream and he says, the Lord says to him, you're dead, you're a dead man because you have another man's wife. And he says, Lord, you know the integrity of my heart. Did not he say that was my sister? See, he didn't even know. But he did, he did live by a law that was already there that said that you're not to have another man's wife unless he was dead. Interesting, isn't it? See, Abraham knew that there was not to be any other God besides God. He knew that there was to be no graven images. You see what I'm saying? Even before the Ten Commandments were out, those, there, those commandments were already in the hearts of the people. Then God finally puts it, engraves it with stone. And, and the reason God does it with his finger before Moses, he's given Moses a sign and the children of Israel a sign. I'll come one day, I'm going to write again with my finger. And he does it right before the Pharisees. And they don't even realize when he's drawing in the sand with his finger, he's demonstrating before them he was God. Manifested right before them. So the thing is, is the Holy Ghost writes these on our heart. So therefore, if the Sabbath is done away because of that, then we'd have to take the rest of those Ten Commandments and do away with them as well. So you can commit adultery now. You can kill now. You'd be able to do all these things. Because when we pervert the Word of God, let me just go back to that. I think that's really important that we understand that one. In Colossians 2.14, 2.14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. 
uh, and having spoiled principalities and powers. He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of a new moon or of the Sabbath days. See, and like I said, in Ezekiel 45, this is where we see that at. So it doesn't do away. In fact, in this particular passage here, nowhere does it mention the laws that were written by Moses in stone. This one here, the ones that are nailed to the cross, are the handwriting of ordinances. And those ordinances, as I mentioned to you earlier, is what we find in Ezekiel 45. Um, so, but again, when we go even into um, Corinthians, uh, Corinthians as well, though, Corinthians was such a beautiful thing there because this is where it actually talks about the commandments that are written in stone. Um, and and because he says right here, but if the menstruation of death written and engraven in stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away with, only the glory of his countenance. Because why? See, he goes into the whole thing about being written on the tables of your heart. Uh, he goes into... Um, how shall not this menstruation of the Spirit be rather glorious? See, again, now you know what he's talking about, the menstruation of, um, of, of, of the Spirit. Um, for the menstruation of the condemnation be glory, much more doth the menstruation of righteousness exceed glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in respect by reason of the glory of that ex excelleth. You know, I actually got this and read this in the literal translation, which actually is a little bit simpler to understand there than it is when you're trying to read it here. It's a little bit, seems a little bit complicated right here. But clearly, um, it is actually the Holy Spirit that we receive. And that's why the table of stone now becomes written on the table of our hearts. In fact, that's another interesting thing about Yeshua drawing in the sand with his finger, because when he drew in the sand with his finger, it caused a conviction to come upon the Pharisees that were falsely accusing her. Not to mention, where is the man that was, you know, if, she, if they caught her in adultery, where is the man that was caught in adultery? Because they were supposed to be stoned together. But when he draws in the sand, he's the one that's going to write those laws on the table of your heart. Uh, so that's another interesting thing. It also declared the fact that he's the one writes the laws on the table of your heart. What with the Holy Ghost? So anyway, as I say, we clearly have the Word of God that supports that we should keep the Sabbath. And in the millennium, the Sabbath be kept as well, just in case you didn't know that. It's another scripture I didn't bring, uh, bring up with me, but it'll be kept in the millennium. So it makes us think that we shouldn't be keeping it now.